Hi fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the venipuncture procedure. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. After watching this lecture recording, you will be able to do the following. You will be able to list the required information on a test requisition form, discuss the appropriate procedures to follow when greeting and reassuring a patient. You will be able to describe correct identification procedures for inpatients and outpatients, describe patient preparation and positioning for venipuncture procedures. You will also be able to correctly assemble the necessary venipuncture equipment and supplies, as well as identify the three veins used most commonly for venipuncture procedures. You will learn how to correctly apply a tourniquet and understand why the tourniquet can be applied only for one minute long. Uh, also describe vein palpation. You'll also be able to discuss the procedure for cleansing the venipuncture site. After watching this lecture recording, you'll be able to state the steps in a venipuncture procedure as well as correctly perform a routine venipuncture using an evacuated tube system. You'll be able to demonstrate safe disposal of contaminated needles and supplies, list the information required on a specimen tube label, and also explain the importance of delivering specimens to the laboratory in a timely manner. There are several key terms associated with this lecture, lecture presentation. These are anacubital fossa, barcodes, basilic vein, cephalic vein, hematoma, hemoconcentration, hemolysis, identification band, median cubital vein, palpation, radiofrequency identification or RFID, requisition form, TOT, and venipuncture. So now that we've gone over the learning outcomes for this lecture, as well as the important terms, let's get started learning about the venipuncture procedure. So venipuncture, which is the puncture of a vein to withdraw a blood sample, is the most frequent blood collection procedure that phlebotomists perform. Phlebotomists must follow the standardized procedures established by their employer to maintain a safe environment for both the patients and themselves. As a phlebotomist, you should develop your style of patient interaction and technique that meets the standards or regulations required for phlebotomy. According to the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, or CLSI, a standardized venipuncture procedure can reduce or eliminate errors that can affect specimen quality and the patient's test results. The rules, regulations, and procedures must be followed at all times. A requisition form is an order for which tests are being collected. Phlebotomists must not collect samples for testing without an order. This order is usually electronic, but sometimes there can be a paper form with orders on them. An electronic test order will contain all the required information if the system has been set up appropriately. When a manual order is received, the phlebotomist must ensure it has the patient's full first and last name, whatever identification number that is required, the patient's date of birth, for inpatients, the location the patient can be found, the test requested, the time and date the specimen should be collected if a specific time or date is required, and special collection or patient information that is needed, as well as billing information. The patient's room number should never be used as a means for identifying the patient. So for example, a physician cannot ask, collect a, a complete blood count on the patient in room 1234. That's unacceptable. It has to be a complete blood count on this patient, Jim Jones, uh, medical record number 1234, date of birth, you know, 0101, 1972. So this is an example of a manual form. Handwritten forms are not ideal as uh, bad handwriting and also misspellings of the test can lead to the wrong test being collected and potentially delaying patient care. Labels are sometimes printed and taken with a phlebotomist, but usually they do not have to manually label a specimen. Many facilities have portable label printers that can be used to scan the patient's ID band and print at, the, at their uh, bedside. Always correctly match the order to the patient's ID. So for inpatients, meaning patients that are in the hospital, if the door is closed, the phlebotomist should knock before entering the room. When entering a room, the phlebotomist should look for signs which may give them information about allergies or restrictions. For example, NPO, which means nothing by mouth and includes no drinks at all. 
They may also have allergies to latex or iodine. The person drawing the patient's blood should introduce themselves and explain the purpose of the visit using non-technical ter non terms, such as, hello, I'm Rebecca and I'm here to collect your blood today. A patient must give consent, which may be verbal or non-verbal. They might say okay and give their arm to the phlebotomist. Uh, but if they say they don't want uh, the sample to be collected, then the phlebotomist should notify the nursing staff and put a note in the record that the patient refused. It's important that the phlebotomist talk to the patient during the procedure and try to get them to speak during it. Um, of course, if a patient is talking to the phlebotomist, then uh, they can notice if the patient starts to faint. Every phlebotomist should have good communication skills. So ask the pa asking the patient if everything's okay and telling them, thank you, have a nice day, or I hope you feel better. The most important procedure that a phlebotomist performs is the patient's identification. If they collect blood from the wrong patient and the sample is labeled uh, with something, so like somebody else's name, uh, it can cause the death of the patient or delay care. The Joint Commission, CLSI, and CAP recommend that two identifiers such as a first and last name and the date of birth be used. For inpatients, the phlebotomist must ask the patient to state their first and last name and date of birth. So they cannot just walk in and say, um, hello, are you James Jordan born on you know, November 15th, 2000? So they have to actually ask them their first and last name and their date of birth. So they must compare what the patient tells them with the identification band uh, wristband on the patient. So if an inpatient does not have an ID band, the phlebotomist must ask the nursing staff to ban the patient before they can collect their blood. If the phlebotomist collects the wrong patient, the wrong result can end up in their patient record. And also a wrong blood type can lead to a fatal uh, transfusion reaction. So patient identification is paramount. Outpatient identification usually involves the patient presenting an ID card at the front desk. When the patient is brought back to the blood drawing area, they need to be asked to state their name and date of birth and compare that to the printed labels. If a patient has an outpatient procedure or is just in bed for a day, they will have a wristband, same like with a, an inpatient. If a patient walks into a blood collection facility as an outpatient, they will not have a wristband. The patient wristbands now usually have a barcode which allows the phlebotomist to scan it with a mobile label printer. This can interface with the laboratory information system and be able to make a label for each tube that is required. The label will usually say what type of tubes to collect. Radio frequency identification, or RFID, is an automated wireless technology that uses radio waves to transmit uh, data for uh, identification. RFID allows additional information to be added later, but a barcode must be reprinted if more information is added to it. To prepare a patient for venipuncture, the phlebotomist must first reassure the patient throughout the procedure. They should start with a brief explana explanation of the procedure so they know what to expect. It's not the phlebotomist's job to give specific details of the tests that are being collected. Uh, the phlebotomist can say the name of the test, but not what the purpose of the test is. If fasting is required for that test, it must be verified that the patient has been fasting. Also, the patient should be asked if they are taking any blood thinners, as this can mean that pressure needs to be applied longer um, on that venipuncture site before applying the bandage. The patient should be asked if they have any allergies that should be, they should be made aware of. Um, and if a person is allergic to latex, they should be assured that the tourniquet, the gloves, and the bandage and other supplies that are being used do not contain latex. They also may want to see the packaging if they've had severe reactions in the past due to latex. The patient should be positioned in a seated or reclined position and should never be standing. A patient who begins to faint can be reclined or laid flat, which can prevent them from passing out. If a patient is chewing gum or eating, they uh, must be asked to remove gum or candy or swallow food that they are chewing before the procedure is started. A specially designed chair will have an arm that comes down in front of the patient. This supports the arm and can also prevent them from falling out of the chair. It's good to have the arm fully supported and angled downward or they can use a wedge. When adjusting inpatients, 
Phlebotomists must always remember that they must return the patient to the original position and put arm rails up, especially for patients that have a fall risk. Uh, the patient is usually lying in the bed, so the phlebotomist will need to ask them to make their arm accessible or adjust it into the correct position. The arm should be supported and positioned downward. Remember that patients should not have anything in their mouths when having their blood drawn. Here you can see one patient supporting their arm uh, with the fist of their opposite arm, and then also this other one on the right hand side is using an arm support wedge. Before performing the venipuncture procedure, the phlebotomist should re-examine the laboratory uh, order to ensure that they have all the supplies that they need. They should select appropriate supplies based on the patient's age and condition, their correct type and number of toots, the appropriate gauge needle and holder, syringe or butterfly, the antiseptic required, the bandage, tourniquet, and two by two gauze are all that's needed. These supplies will also need to be inspected to ensure the equipment is in date and the packaging has not been tampered with. The needed supplies should be placed so the phlebotomist can reach them while performing the procedure. The supplies should never be placed on the bed or the patient. Supplies should be placed on the side of the phlebotomist's non-dominant hand, which is used to change tubes. The needle holder will be held with the dominant hand. The tubes should be placed in the order that they will be collected. Extra tubes should be handy in case tubes that have, like, have lost their vacuum and a new one is needed. Hand hygiene is the most important factor in preventing healthcare-associated infections. Hands should be washed with soap and water or hand sanitizing gel in front of the patient. It's important to follow the hand washing procedure established in the facility where the blood is being drawn. A good procedure is for the phlebotomist to introduce themselves, ask the patient to give their first name, last name, and date of birth. Then the phlebotomist should tell them that they are going to wash or sanitize their hands and get their gloves on after the correct patient has been uh, uh, verified. The tourniquet is applied three to four inches above the venipuncture site. It will impede venous flow, allowing accumulation of blood and making the veins easier to find. Arterial flow is not affected. The tourniquet is applied, the vein is located, the tourniquet is removed, the site is cleansed, the supply should be prepared while the alcohol dries, the tourniquet should be reapplied, anchor the vein and insert the needle. Uh, so the tourniquet should not be on for more than one minute. CLSI recommends that the tourniquet should be released for two minutes between applications. Uh, while training, we'll normally do this step in two steps, while many phlebotomists are able to find a vein, clean the site, and remove the tourniquet within one minute. These photos show the proper way to apply a tourniquet. It should be pos positioned three to four inches above the venipuncture site. Uh, the ends should be crossed over and tightened using the dominant hand to tuck the tourniquet section that is on the bottom over the top. This means the loose end is up and the loop is toward the antecubital area. The image on the left hand side of this slide shows an arm ready for vena puncture. The loose end is what needs to be pulled to remove the tourniquet. When selecting a vein for venipuncture, the phlebotomist feels for the major veins of the antecubital fossa. Uh, the median cubital vein is between the other two and is the best option for the venipuncture procedure. The cephalic vein is the most lateral and the basilic vein is the most medial. If you remember that B is for basilic and B is for body, then you will know which one is nearest the body, which is the basilic vein. These veins form an H or an M pattern. On some people, the veins on the lower arm may bulge and be good options, but this is not as common. The image on the left shows an H pattern, and the image on the right shows an M pattern. The dorsal side of the hands can be options if you are able to locate a vein in the antecubital fossa region. Vein location is done both by sight and feel. The phlebotomist should apply a tourniquet and have the patient clench their fist. The ability to feel the vein is much more important than the ability to see the vein. Using the index finger on their non-dominant hand, the phlebotomist can feel for the vein using a pushing rather than a stroking motion. Palpation should be done to determine the size, depth, and direction of the vein to help direct the needle during insertion. 
Landmarks on the patient's arm can help to remember where the vein is after it has been cleansed, as the area cannot be touched again before inserting the needle, unless it's cleaned again, of course. A back and forth motion using 70% isopropyl alcohol to scrub the area is used for cleansing the site of routine venipuncture. The drying time is from 30 to 60 minutes and the needle should not be inserted when the area is wet um, as this can cause a burning sensation and the alcohol could also get into it and contaminate the sample. So any type of blowing, fanning, or manually drying the site with anything should be avoided. When the alcohol is drying, supplies should be gathered, making sure that they are on the side of the phlebotomist's non-dominant hand to avoid reaching over. The multi-sampling needle needs to be attached to the holder. The phlebotomist will screw the stopper puncturing end of the double-ended multi-sampling needle with a clear cap into the holder. The needle and holder may come pre-assembled by the manufacturer. Do not remove the sterile colored cap from the other end of the needle. The first tube to be collected must be inserted into the needle holder up to the designated mark without punch puncturing into it. At this point, the phlebotomist should visually examine the supplies for any damage or expiration dates, also making sure that there are extra tubes within reach. The phlebotomist must then reapply the tourniquet, move the safety device out of the way, remove the colored needle cap, examine puncture equipment for defects, position the needle assembly with the bevel up. The BD brand needle has a safety device up, so it must be up. Uh, the phlebotomist will then anchor the vein with the thumb of their non-dominant hand, position their four fingers around the arm, but make sure that they aren't trapped under the arm. If veins are on the surface, they might roll and the needle will not go into the vein. So the needle um, should be inserted at a 15 to 30 degree angle and going in too deep or too shallow should be avoided. To properly fill the tubes, the phlebotomist must hold the holder and needle steady, making sure that they do not push it in deeper while using the non-dominant hand to push the tube onto the sampling needle. Uh, the flange is held with the index finger while pushing the tube with the thumb. The tube should then be allowed to fill. To prevent any chance of blood refluxing back into the needle, the tube should be held at a downward angle and slight pressure can be applied while the tubes are being filled. The correct order of draw, of course, must be followed. Then the phlebotomist will use their non-dominant hand to pull off the tube with a twisting motion while holding the holder steady with their dominant hand. The tube should then be inverted. The phlebotomist must use peripheral vision to grab the next tube and insert it as they did with the first tube. This procedure needs to be re repeated until all of the tubes are full. While drawing blood, the phlebotomist can brace their hand on the patient's arm to hold it steady. The patient must be instructed to release their fist and remove the tourniquet after the last tube has been drawn. If there are a large number of tubes and the tourniquet has been on for a minute, it may be released before the draw is complete. The last tube must be removed before the needle is removed to prevent dripping of any blood. The tourniquet should be removed next to avoid bruising. This bruising is known as a hematoma caused by bleeding under the skin. The phlebotomist should remove the needle with a swift, smooth motion while being careful not to drag it across the arm. The two by two gauze is then applied with pressure. Pressure should not be applied while the needle is still in the arm. The safety of the device needs to be activated against a hard surface, not on the patient or the patient's bed. And the needle then needs to be disposed of in a shark's container. Either the patient or the phlebotomist can apply pressure with the gauze to the venipuncture site. The tubes need to be inverted the required number of times for the additive or anticoagulant. The process of needle disposal is completed while also asking the patient to hold pressure or the phlebotomist holding pressure. The needle is removed, the safety device is activated, and then discarded in an approved sharps container. Needles should never be bent, cut, or recapped. Also, the needle should never be stuck into a patient's bed. It needs to go into the approved sharps container. While the patient is holding pressure on the site, the phlebotomist must then label all of the tubes they collected. Most tubes are labeled with a printed label that is computer generated, but they may have to write on the label with a ballpoint pen. The ballpoint pen is used to prevent the writing from running off. The phlebotomist must include the full name, date of birth, date and time of collection, and their initials on every single tube that was collected. 
Once the tubes have been inverted and labeled, the phlebotomist must check if bleeding has stopped. After lifting the gauze to check, if there's no bleeding, the phlebotomist must apply a bandage or fold gauze and then apply a wrap. The patient should be asked which they prefer. If the patient is allergic to band-aids, paper tape can be used. The contaminated material must then be removed. The wrappers, caps, alcohol wipes, and gauze can go into just the regular trash. Needles and used tubes not used for testing should go into the sharps container. If something is dripping with blood, it should go into the biohazard trash, not a sharps container. In all reality though, nothing should be dripping in blood when uh, performing a venipuncture procedure. Before leaving the patient, the phlebotomist should return the bed to the original position with bed rails up if an inpatient setting. They should remove their gloves and sanitize their hands. Lastly, they should remember to thank the patient before leaving. The specimens must now be delivered to the lab. This can occur at specific times, in containers, with couriers, or through a pneumatic tube system. The phlebotomist must make sure they complete any required paperwork or logging information into a computer. Some sites may log the number of samples collected for statistical purposes. A sample should never be left in a patient's room or be unlabeled ever. Getting the label incorrect can kill a patient. So this concludes this presentation. If you found this video helpful, please like it and remember to subscribe to my channel. Feel free to leave comments or questions below. I'd be happy to answer anything you have for me.